podcasting from Dallas, Texas. I am Shireen, and this is the Yumlish Podcast. Yumlish empowers people with chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes and heart disease to take charge of their health through diet. And this podcast is created to amplify the voices of patients, health professionals, employers, and community members who are working to reduce the risk of these chronic diseases and put your health first. Featured as a 2020 change maker in the food system by Washington City Paper, Tamara Ray Stevenson is a visionary founder and CEO of Wanda. Women Advancing Nutrition, Dietetics, and Agriculture. Appointed by Mayor Bowser to the D.C. Food Policy Council, Tamara serves as the council's first public health nutritionist and co-chairs the Food System and Nutrition Education Working Group, which is championing nutrition education for all. Welcome, Tamara. Hi, thank you for having me. An absolute pleasure having you on. So Tamara, I want to dive right in. And my first question to you is, what really led you to become a public health nutritionist? I think for me, um, early on as a kid growing up in Oklahoma, I saw my family um, impacted by a number of chronic diseases um, from diabetes, stroke, to heart disease, cancer. And I thought being a doctor was uh, the the right path to do. But over time, um, having been a first generation college student and getting a chance to be exposed to um, public health, um, interning at Harvard Public Health in nutrition and realizing that there was a whole other world within health that I could be very exact in looking at food as medicine, um, combined with having a mindset of like, Harriet Tubman, who some would affectionately call her the Moses of the people, um, but combining that element around like food representing a path to freedom and how can I lead, you know, my community, my people to freedom uh, through the power of food. Um, and so for me, being in the population health based space around nutrition just made um, the exact sense from a career perspective in alignment with that vision and mission for uh, my life. You know, you talked about sort of um, that element of food colonialism. Um, What is that? Can you tell us a little bit about that and how has it helped shape sort of these quote unquote right and wrong foods? Yeah, again, um, food colonialism was something, uh, just like any diagnosis that we learn in healthcare, that once I was able to find a name to uh, a very uh, community-based issue, then it helped me to shape then what is the prognosis for the community. And so for me, as I've come to learn food colonialism through um, my writings in, in my PhD program um, at American, it help me to understand one, what is colonialism period and how does that apply to the food system? And some of the best ways that I sum it up for many is uh, the three E's. We have the erasure, um, the erasing of what I call um, with the work of Wanda, um, elevating the hidden figures of the food system. Some people look at the food and not the women behind it um, and their culinary currency, which flows into the exploitation of when you think about labor practices within the food system and not having fair wages across the supply chain that tends to happen. Um, And then the third is the extraction, just like those who search for tropical uh, disease remedies in the Amazon, extracting the essence of the plant, that is what we tend to do when it comes to the food system, extracting the essence of what we want and, and, and toss away all the other parts, including the labor aspect. Um, when you think about the 1099 fire at wheel kind of mindset um, and not uh, truly supporting both people, planet, and profit in this triple bottom line mindset that we see in social entrepreneurship. Um, and then the other components uh, with colonialism is the divide and conquer strategy 
um, that you'll find dividing communities, um, dividing a district, as you'll see in D.C., the numbers show a 20 year age gap between of life expectancy of my community of Anacostia in Ward 8 compared to uh, the other uh, west of the Anacostia River um, in Ward 2 and 3 locations. Um, and then you have the control, the controlling of just like anyone who is a game designer, you know that you control uh, what are the final outcomes in a Super Mario Brother game. You think you have choices, but the choices were already predetermined. And so that is a control of the food supply and what options that you have. Um, and then you also have um, beyond the divide, the conquer uh, control, um, you just... Um, have um, and just the capitalism that happens along with it. Um, and so for me, when we think about the decolonized movement, it helped, that background helps to contextualize, well, what do you mean to decolonize our food system, to decolonize our diet? And it's having what terms that we hear, food sovereignty, where people, the community have some level of ownership versus a dependency uh, perspective when it comes to the food system, uh, that they can grow their own food, that should be an option having access to land that tends to be a challenge with land uh, grabs that you see in the global south, also no, very known historically here in the U.S. Um, and then when you think about, um, again, uh, equity in not only the pay of labor, but also in what food should represent. So in my community, it, food is available through corner stores. We know from the subsidies of our food system, uh, what does that mean for quality of nutrients in food? And so that gives way to an obesogenic environment. And so how do you correct this idea that food should not heal, uh, kill you, food should be healing you. And if there is a systemic um, oppression using food uh, as a weaponized tool to um, harm communities, how can we truly have a productive nation and, and workforce uh, to uphold to this um, idea of a robust economy. Um, and so all that uh, is why food is such a powerful way of looking through the lens of our value system um, as a country. Um, and at a critical time now where we have a new administration coming in, um, really uh, upholding to this idea that our policies should reflect uh, the values we have in the people um, and how can we come together to make that happen with a new agenda. When you talk about uh, food oppression, Tamara, could you um, explain that a bit more and probably with an example? And then I'd love to get your take on how food oppression sort of can lead to chronic illnesses uh, with the specific focus on diabetes, which is a space that you know we work in. So I'd love to get your take on that. Yeah, having had a grandma who died from complications of diabetes, um, we tend to use the term now metabolic health um, as a way to encapsulate um, you know, diabetes that we see in our communities. Um, but, you know, that's the end of the line from a consumer patient perspective. But well before that time um, came in, in the supply chain, you had starting with just agriculture, the growing of food on land. Um, you know, there's a lot of controversy, obviously, around genetically modified crops. Um, on top of pesticides being used with the big historical uh, case that was uh, one against uh, Monsanto um, and, and the use of how do we care for our plants? How does those plants and pesticides combine um, impact uh, not only the bioavailability of nutrients in our bodies, um, but also, um, you know, creates, you know, like ticking time bombs. And we, uh, unfortunately have had a time period where science has not always uh, been valued, um, but science in its proper context um, from a literacy perspective is really important, which is what, what we tend to call food literacy, which is really more than just, you know, naming uh, the vitamin and minerals in a food, but really understanding what took from a production standpoint, this food to your table. And not only that, going beyond the table, how does it impact your health? And so the oppression comes in many different forms and the lack of education around food and nutrition. Um, the oppression comes from uh, the availability of food um, in a community. Um, if I were to go across the street um, to the local corner market, 
what foods are going to be available, the fact that I am in a community of 170,000 residents east of the river with uh, two Safeways and a Giant as full stores compared to the 22 new grocery stores that came on board um, just in a span of less than a decade um, on the west side of the Anacostia River um, in a population um, that's not even at a million in DC, um, much lower than that. One has to question um, what what is, again, our values? How do the food we have align with that? Because otherwise, oppression, um, is using food to be weaponized. And if we are literally harming US citizens through food, then one has to say, are we really at a war against ourselves? Um, and how do we win a war that has been a civil war turned inward? Um, and that for me has been through a multiple uh, kind of like social determinants of health approach from the policy that must change, the propaganda in terms of what media covers, um, which I currently study now, on top of the programs in communities. Um, when we unleash uh, nutritionists out, are they continuing the same rhetoric of a status quo or is that being challenged? Um, because we all are part of of this will uh, that goes round and unless that will um, is corrected, uh, it will not change. And the, the will will continue to run over the very communities that it should be serving. One of the, one of the items you talked about with uh, nutrition education, that is certainly something that we pride ourselves on is providing the type of education where um, there isn't much uh, available information to that end. And so we pride ourselves on providing that. How does one, I guess, you know, then my question becomes, so you, you can provide the education, but then you also touched upon the availability of foods and sort of that socioeconomic element. How does one begin to sort of address that in an equitable way? Uh, well, people have called on reparations in general. Um, I specifically would say it's culinary reparations when it comes to the food system and the historical nature of uh, oppression of um, Black, Indigenous people of color um, and, you know, ways in which we correct that <laughs> with this new administration uh, for me is uh, putting a Black woman ahead of the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, because we have an issue of race and gender as I study intersectionality and a lot can be lost in the sauce when we only take one perspective of the isms that looks at the situation that we have unfolded. Um, when we think about uh, those who were promised um, post-emancipation um, and reconstruction, 40 acres and a mule that never came about on top of the systemic racism that came from um, past USC policies um, that has created a land loss, um, it looks like those being able to have access to land, access uh, to affordable foods that represent their culture um, that has not always been available. Um, and one of the things that I champion about, you know, are from just even a biological perspective that our genes, just like research that has been done um, post um, just the impact of the Nazi regime um, when it came to the Holocaust, that we literally have trapped historical trauma in our bodies, in our memory cells. And those same cells also um, captures, in my opinion, the idea of our ancestral foods and foods become a man, a way in which just like a light switch, we turn on and off. And so if we have access to the foods of our ancestors, what I say strong food for strong people, our body will uh, incorporate that in a more dynamic way to create stronger bodies when we think about the impact of his health disparities and the dire related diseases. If we have had a system where we're seeing more fruits and vegetables and grains, but it's foods that don't reflect the culture of the community, um, lack of education and knowledge has been lost, intentionally severed, um, how do we change and reverse diabetes? How do we um, address these issues of, uh, of lifestyle changes? And we have, we have had a Westernized lifestyle that we have been managing. And a part of that Western lifestyle has been 
uh, just the undue harm of stress that gives way to inflammation in the body. Um, we self-medicate with food and alcohol. Uh, a study that just, you know, done on just Google searches over the election showed that between Chinese food, <laughs> fries, and alcohol, um, and pizza, those were the top ways in which people were self-medicating um, through the stress of the election. Um, and so I can only imagine, you know, what will be the health implications? Were your bowels moving after that? Um, were you drinking water to flush those toxins out of your body? I mean, these are real things like you will suffer the consequences of the choices that we make and the choices are what's available to us. Um, and that is just the dynamic that we're in that we have to address at so many different levels um, through policy, through practice, and through the power of platforms um, such as yours as well. Um, when we're talking about, um, you know, eating and, and sort of self-medicating, right? Is the is who is the onus upon? Is the onus upon the you know the the food retailer? Is it upon you know who who then makes a case for profitability, perhaps? Is it upon policymakers? Is it on the individual? Where where does the buck stop? So again, uh, being and now looking at uh, media technology and democracy, I, I came across a study um, that involved actually one of my mentors, Dr. Kuniuka. Uh, it was systemic, the uh, a review of stories over the last decade around health disparities, um, how those stories was framed, were analyzed, and, and what the study revealed was that uh, a lot of uh, onus was put upon the individual. What individuals should do for, uh, to help lose obesity uh, through weight loss, through nutrition, and that was it. There was no recognition that there was a system at play, policy at play, and so I pushed back on what we have intentionally done because who benefits? Corporations um, benefit um, those who are in the healing industry and healing industry from pharma uh, and, and to the food systems, they all benefit from this. And so in order to change that, we have to put onus onto policy uh, that creates an enabling or disabling environment that provides the limit or plethora of choices for people to decide on top of the lack of health professionals, let alone of color, uh, that we don't have access to in communities. Um, in nutrition dietetics field is the numbers so far say 2.5% are of uh, African descent, less than 10% people of color. Uh, when you think about uh, the field, which has membership around 89,000 or so, and that's not enough troops on the ground to win this war against uh, if we are in a food fight uh, for our health. And so we need uh, stronger investment in uh, loan repayment programs uh, for those going into nutrition. It's available for doctors, for PAs, for nurses. Why not for nutritionists? That, that takes leadership demand for these sorts of changes. And it takes um, people who recognize that the dietary guidelines don't reflect um, what, what we see in need of diversity of foods. Um, but it's it's kind of like the research. Uh, if it's an industry within itself, a lot of research has been uh, based on just uh, Caucasian Americans or particularly uh, white males, if we were to be even more specific. And so that's where the whole intentionality of race and gender must be a part of the dynamic. We, yes, we are all humans, but we do have some differences. Um, and I'm not talking about eugenic differences, to be quite clear, um, that we have to acknowledge when it comes to um, our cultural needs. So what I'm hearing is it it's sort of the onus falls on everyone, the policymakers, the most definitely. It takes a village to raise a child. That's part of even just African philosophy, Ubuntu, um, and and so many others, uh, African cultures that recognize the communalism approach that is polar opposite of Russianization um, that focuses on the individual. And I think as the culture of America becomes reflected of this diversity, you know, like any cultural hybridity issue, we should take our culture with us. Um, it should not be one where in order to exist, we have to uh, fully, you know, assimilate, but we 
uphold both this dual world that we live in. And I hope with the reflection of um, this administration that it shows the importance that you can bring your full self to your job, to your communities, to your homes, and also to the food system. Um, and it should be gone the days where, you know, if it's white, is not right. If it's brown, it should stick around. And that has been the opposite of the messaging when we think about white rice, white milk, white potatoes. Um, is not to say like natural white producing things like onion and garlic, which I love, um, but we should be embracing foods of color. Like we should be embracing people of color. And that's what we're not seeing on a consistent basis. But those diversity of foods literally represent different spectrums, just like we learn in physics of, um, of flavonoids um, and, and just foods along the whole. Roy G. Biv is what we call it. Um, of every color represents a different nutrient um, and, and quantity and quality. And we must value all of the rainbow of foods, not just one. So why would we value just one particular uh, uphold uh, supremacy of idea of color when it comes to people, um, but the opposite when it comes to food? So there should be consistency in messaging. You mentioned a few uh, minutes ago about gender, and I want to touch on this question because um, so you do health and nutrition classes for women in D.C. in Ward 7 and 8. Um, and you specifically mentioned that when you educate a woman, you educate a community. So I'd love to get your take on what does that mean when it comes to nutrition? Yeah, um, again, gender, um, I didn't see or know the value of what it means to be a woman as a kid. I thought being the tomboy, playing with the boys, that was the way to go in life to survive. But having been a mom, worked in women's policy, working on global nutrition issues around gender, uh, seeing the data, that transformed me. Um, and it transformed me in recognizing one, no matter where I am, no matter how many degrees that I have, my kids are going to be looking to me to eat. Um, and I need to know how to cook. This is just a basic survival skill. If we were to think very logically about this, if you're thrown on an island, can you survive? Um, and so for me, it took that approach to understanding that is critical. Women, um, just from the nature of uh, the life represent the circle, we operate in sisterhood and community communing and food is another form of communication that we commune when we think about Sundays, uh, historically traditions of gathering together, creating potluck meals. I remember those days. I miss those days of my aunts and my grandma, my mom, like all the women coming together. And this is not, you know, trying to go 1950s on women and roll back, you know, <laughs> this idea of progress, but it's understanding some just basic common sense that we all should know how to survive in this world and thrive and food has been weaponized and how do we use it as a tool of liberation um, for ourselves and for our communities um, in a way. And that means it takes knowledge, it takes understanding the, the history of our ancestors, of the women in our family. How do we carry that rich knowledge forward that if we're not going to leave a million bucks to our, our, our children, how do we live a million bucks in the form of wisdom and legacy and upholding culture? Um, because we we truly are the cultural keepers um, from a culinary perspective in our family. And I don't think that's something that should be uh, lightly tossed away. Um, yes, men can cook. I love a man who can cook as well, but I love that I could cook for myself too if I need to. Um, and so that's part of the, the forces of duality that we all should have a role that we complement one another together. Um, and we just tend to see, and it just shows women tend to think more about fruits, vegetables, and grain and eat more of that compared to men who may be eating more meats. And yes, a more of a plant-based diet is moving forward to help people and planet, which I support. But I do also support this idea that women do play a critical role in our communities. We cannot give up this sacred notion of what food represents as this ritual form of communication in our families and how we lock in um, wisdom in that food, in that recipe, like an archaeological or anthropological dig. Um, it, that recipe is something that can be uh, rediscovered and re by reclaiming your culture and food. And that's what we've taught these women in a new way, because 
through westernization when you think about food media as it presents food now it's through this lens of colonization of looking at food from an extractive exploitative um erasure kind of lens and so for us it's about adding that context around food in a way that's receiving just like putting you know sugar in the medicine to make it go down you know that's what culture do does with food because it's, it's an extension of our identity and it helps food create a community. And we are doing that through the Wanda Academy, creating a sisterhood of self-care and service that's supportive and understanding the power of food as a way in which we acknowledge the culinary legacy of our of the women in our family and how do we uphold to restore our health, reclaim our food way and return back to our roots. We are toward the end of the episode, unfortunately, at this point. So I'd love uh, for our listeners to learn how they can connect with you and, and learn more about your work. Awesome. Thank you so much. I would say for those who um, are interested in work that we do at Wanda, we have our website, iamwanda.org. And also we're across all social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at iamwanda.org or at underscore I am Wanda ORG on Instagram. Um, so happy to connect to those who would love to partner or bring our programs to your community. Um, and so it's it's important to recognize that food is more than just um, a fuel for our bodies, but it's a way in which we show a form of diplomacy and peace around the world. And uh, a hungry belly can definitely cause a war. So let's make sure we feed everyone and create more peace. I love it. Thank you so very much for your time, Tamara. This was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. So find Yumlish on all the social media accounts linked in our podcast show notes. Our Yumlish socials help you learn more about our mission at Yumlish, keep you updated on helpful tips for managing your diabetes and giving you access to exciting opportunities with Yumlish. With that, to our listeners in Texas, Yumlish will be running a diabetes management course here in the Dallas region. If you are interested, email us at info at yumlish.com and we'll, we'll connect you over to that. Lastly, if you enjoy Yumlish podcasts and know a healthcare expert working in the nutrition space, uh, reach out to us on Instagram to nominate them. Send us a DM telling us who you want to nominate, what they do, and why you believe their work is making a difference in the lives of individuals to conquer chronic illness. Thank you again. Until next time, stay well. Thank you for listening to the Yumlish podcast with Shireen. If you like our show and want to learn more, you can find information at yumlish.com. You can also leave us a review here. We will see you at the next one. And remember, your health always comes first. <laughs>